Uh, hello and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Elizabeth Gress. I'm our Director of Partnerships, Communications, and Regulatory Affairs at the Kidney Project. And we are excited to have you all with us today for a special session um, with Dr. John Watson from UC San Diego. Um, Dr. Watson is a mechanical engineer and a physiologist by training. Uh, who spent nearly three decades at the National Institutes of Health, uh, first as the chief of their artificial heart program from 1976 to 1994, and then later in senior administrative roles, including acting director of the National uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Um, since 2004, Dr. Watson has been a, a professor of bioengineering at UC San Diego, um, where he is also the associate director of their Liebig Center for Entrepreneurism and Technology Advancement. Uh, among his many honors, Dr. Watson was the first uh, NIH scientist or engineer to be elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and he's also a member of their uh, nominating committee for their prestigious Draper Prize. Um, we are really honored to have Dr. Watson with us here today to share the story of how the field of artificial heart technology evolved over a period of a few decades and what lessons might be useful for us in the artificial kidney world. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Watson, for joining us. And um, we'll start with your presentation um, as soon as you're ready. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and uh, looking forward to uh, Thank you, Liz. presenting. All right, everybody, sorry for the uh, delay. So um, what I hope to leave you with is that uh, it's important to have a uh, to build the capacity uh, that's needed to uh, um, create multiple generations of a evolving technology. And the uh, certainly kidney dialysis, when it was initiated uh, through the NIH artificial kidney program, it was an e evolving technology, uh, but it was terminated uh, too soon by the NIH. Uh, and um, the technology has not taken off in new directions as uh, uh, proposed by Ben Burton. So what we were dealing with with the artificial heart was um, uh, producing a uh, alternative to cardiac transplant and um, the expert opinions that we were uh, given after much, oh, now why is it changing on me? The uh, expert opinions on um, what was needed in a, uh, uh, a alternative to cardiac transplant boiled down to um, a maximum output of 10 liters per minute that we needed, of course, to have normal blood pressure. And the cardiologists predicted that uh, the mortality uh, of these patients that were envisioned for, that would need a artificial heart device would be 50% at two years. So what I was interested in the audience seeing is how that prediction uh, actually worked out in clinical trial. So the first uh, clinical trial, uh, randomized trial using the HeartMate 1, and we'll look closer at how we got to the HeartMate 1, um, was, is shown here. This is the medical, optimal medical therapy group, 2001. And, um, if you look here at six months, instead of two years, six months, we had a 50% mortality. So these uh, patients uh, were very, very sick. And they were, when they were put on their device, if we had not randomized patients, 
uh, we would have had a 50% mortality showing up here at uh, 12 months. And the cardiologist would have uh, said, well, we can do that uh, without uh, implanting such a, a uh, large device. And um, so the patients were much sicker than well predicted by the uh, expert opinion. There's a wonderful book called The Undoing Project by Tvorsky and Candleman that shows that expert opinion is uh, frequently um, incorrect. Um, but also I wanted the uh, audience to see that in 2009, the second, the HeartMate 2 was introduced and tested against the HeartMate 1. So this is the HeartMate 1 uh, results uh, almost a decade later, and the survival is exactly the same on a kaplan myer survival curve. Um, while the new device, the continuous flow system, rather than a pulsatile flow device, had a much improved uh, survival uh, rate. So that was the second generation device. Now, why did we think assisted uh, cardiac assist systems would work? Uh, and this is one of the compelling uh, papers for me, uh, where, turn it, uh, showing a uh, heterotopic cardiac transplant. And, um, if you will, this just looks like what you'll see in the next slide is an assist device to the um, to the for the patient. So here's the sick heart shown in red, and the uh, 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 second heart, the implant, the transplant, and that. Uh, Uh, assisting the natural heart. There was a, so these patients actually had two cardiac outputs. So they had two pressure pulses and um, two EKGs. And it really didn't make much difference to the circulation as long as they got the function they needed. That is the blood flow to provide nutrients and remove waste. So we really focused on function and not trying to mimic nature. So this is the HeartMate 1 uh, showing how it was implanted and um, how it uh, operated in terms of uh, the rematch trial, the first trial I showed you about. Now, how did we get to the HeartMate 1? Well, we developed a vision statement for that, which was designing a highly reliable two-year ventricular assist device system that provided a good quality of life, that was most important, and function, which society could afford. And we predicted a 15-year timeline to get from the beginning of that vision to where we could be in uh, clinical trials. And we boiled this program down to um, this slide, which uh, I always uh, had a, a, a uh, uh, saying that if you couldn't boil down what you want to accomplish in one page that you really needed to keep working and planning on what, uh, how you might uh, proceed to get to the uh, finish line that you were headed towards. So in 1977, sorry about that. I don't know why they uh, flipped back. This is the, uh, the, the program plan that we had uh, that we would work on blood pumps, 
as a separate program where we had uh, four, around four different concepts under uh, research. Uh, energy converters, they would convert DC power to AC power for the, uh, uh, to use the battery power to produce an energy converter to drive the blood pump and to get the energy that was required which is uh, two watts of energy at the level of the blood through either uh, percutaneous piercing the skin or transcutaneous across the intact skin. And we also had a program uh, doing a special fabrication and providing mock loops to all the uh, participant groups. So the mock loops would produce results that were comparable between laboratories. We had no work going on in batteries, but we followed what was going on in the uh, general public. Uh, these programs were reviewed essentially every year by an outside peer review group and decided uh, either to uh, end the program or continue the program based on the progress of each of these four areas. Uh, in 1980, we were, uh, uh, given permission to then begin integrating these uh, systems that were uh, under study in the first phase into implantable uh, ventricular assist device systems. And we were able to complete that. Uh, and then again, in 1984, we were given uh, uh, support to have a two-year reliability study of four of these uh, integrated systems. So this boiled down to one of the most important parts of the uh, program, and that was a uh, reliability study to show that we could actually uh, had devices that could operate for two years, and they could do this in a reliable, predictable manner. Um, and then in, uh, it actually took five years to get uh, this program completed. And then in 1991, uh, around that time, we had the, re, uh, the HeartMate 1 that was ready for clinical trial and uh, a, um, uh, a, a grant was, provide, uh, was uh, awarded to a successful proposal to uh, begin the rematch trial. So that led to the HeartMate 1, which is depicted here in this slide, in which uh, it was a, pumper, a pusher plate. So this plate moved up and down to produce the pumping action. And we had an inlet valve, an outlet valve, the pusher plate, the flexing diaphragm, and uh, a vent to vent behind the piston to provide constant uh, pressure so that the pumping action would not be impeded. So jumping ahead, the results of the HeartMate 1 went on to produce the HeartMate 2 and the HeartMate 3. And these are patients with the HeartMate 3. On the left is a uh, man who received his device at age 82. I think he's 86 in this picture and some other patients. And you, it's uh, hard to uh, tell who's the patient, for instance, here, and uh, who, uh, and the same with this lady, she does not have an implant. Here's uh, something uh, that uh, uh, these patients live as they want to. Uh, they're uh, verbally forbidden to get near water because they have a percutaneous lead that could become uh, uh, dampened and, uh, and encourage infection. Um, but they uh, do quite well on their own and they... Uh, uh, the, here's a couple of more patients. Here on the end is a young man young lady who uh, uh, is also shown uh, walking across a little water pit. Um, again, uh, we recommend not uh, getting near water 
but patients, as I say, lived as they so uh, wanted. So this is the HeartMate 3, jumping ahead um, to the third generation. And now we have a fourth generation that's been uh, produced by uh, uh, the company Abbott. Um, there are no valves. There's no vent. There's no inflow graph. It disconnects directly to the left ventricle. The motor uh, drives a centrifugal pump that is um, ele uh, levitated so that there are no bearings. All of those were eliminated in the design. And this is the HeartMate 1 that you saw. And um, that uh, resulted in a, the rematch trial, which then led uh, to showing a uh, clinical benefit and an improvement in function. And then in the HeartMate 2, you can see the difference in the uh, uh, volume, uh, even though these are all capable of putting out uh, seven, eight liters uh, of cardiac output. And uh, we also learned uh, how to maintain normal blood pressure. So the, the requirements were met in that regard. And here's the HeartMate 3, um, which shows uh, that there's no inflow graph per se. This is a power uh, supply, percutaneous lead. And this is the uh, outflow graph. Uh, to the peripheral circulation. So how are we doing as far as quality of life? Well, um, this is the original medical, medi uh, optimal medical therapy curve. This is with the HeartMate 1. This is with the HeartMate 2. This is with the HeartMate 3. The dotted line here is the transplant survival. So, uh, we are uh, approaching uh, the uh, 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 clinical uh, level of the uh, heart mate, I'm sorry, of uh, the cardiac transplant in terms of the heart mate three, the third generation. And uh, I don't have a slide, but uh, this has now been uh, equaled in the fourth generation systems. So the adverse events, uh, are uh, real. Uh, there's always been a uh, difficulty with infection with a system like this that is uh, moving around in, uh, inside the uh, patient to some extent and uh, the uh, uh, mutual motion between the soft tissues and the device uh, and the percutaneous lead can lead to infections. Uh, there have been uh, bleeding issues in terms of the von Willebrand factor being broken down by the continuous flow systems. So the uh, third and fourth generation uh, have a pulsation capability. And uh, thrombus uh, difficulties have been greatly reduced by going to the levitated uh, uh, centrifugal pump because of the wide gaps uh, for uh, the blood flow through the device. And uh, here's a 70 year old lady um, on her bike. Uh, we recommend that the patients not get out a cell phone um, uh, contact and she uh, clearly doesn't care about that. She's just enjoying herself with um, her newfound energy with her uh, assist device. So that covers the uh, points that I wanted to make and uh, I'll stop the share. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, fascinating to hear the a compressed history of almost you know 40 years worth of work in a space of about 20 minutes. So thank you. Um, Lots of uh, terms. Our audience is diverse from with different backgrounds. So I'll probably ask a couple of questions just to get our audience calibrated. 
uh, one of the things that you mentioned that caught my attention uh, was you said the program really worked to get a device to have function uh, to, and that is sufficient to keep them going. And obviously you showed pictures about people with the riding bikes and doing rock climbing, water. But you also mentioned not reproduce fully what nature has done. Correct. Can you talk to a little bit about the, the thinking behind that and uh, how that came about? Well, part of it was my own experience with assisted circulation. Um, I was uh, uh, at Parkland Hospital in, in Dallas where I trained at Southwestern Medical School and um, uh, headed up the uh, uh, inter aortic balloon team. Uh, and um, I saw where, uh, and to begin with, with the inner aortic balloon, there was a strong feeling that you had to time it really quite well with the EKG of the patient. And we found pretty quickly that the patient didn't care, uh, I, the physiology of the patient didn't care if we were synchronized with the heart or not synchronized with the heart. And, um, uh, I had a, a strong feeling that uh, if we could duplicate uh, that uh, needed a blood flow in some manner. And in fact, uh, I liken the thoughts that you have about your system with the uh, filtration system and the uh, cell system. That's sort of like our blood pumps and energy converters. Two uh, complementary important areas, but worked on such that you could integrate them uh, and uh, do the work uh, with several groups, four in, in working on blood pumps and four working on energy converters uh, to find a, uh, a pathway to get to where you could produce the function without trying to duplicate um, because it was clear we, we weren't going to match um, nature. We now have, uh, I think it's probably close to 500 patients that have been on uh, their device now for over 10 years. Some as long as, uh, the longest that I'm aware of is 18 years. And it's remarkable because it wasn't until um, 2014 when the HeartMate 3 was approved for a, a, a clinical long-term destination therapy, as it's called. Liz, maybe that question is coming online. Um, just for everybody out there, uh, HeartMate is the name, is the commercial name uh, of this device. And there's been a number of generations and it is the uh, state of the art, um, at least in uh, artificial heart technology right now. Liz, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Watson. Um, I'm sorry yeah. about the slides, Liz. <laughs> I don't no know worries. why they bounced around, but it must have been me. <laughs> <laughs> technology is mysterious sometimes. Um, no, no problem. Um, so yeah, we do have some questions both about the artificial kidney and artificial heart, but to stay on the artificial heart track uh, a little bit longer. Um, do you have any thoughts on how come there uh, was, was a heart, artificial heart program at um, NIH, but maybe not for artificial kidneys? Or kind of what's the difference between the development stories between these two organs? Well, um, Congress mandated uh, that there be an artificial heart and that there be an artificial kidney at essentially the same time in the early 1960s. It was either 63 or 64, or 1963 or 1964. And um, they did in fact start the artificial kidney program. Uh, and uh, Ben Burton was uh, head of that program. And I was not the original head of the artificial heart program. That was Frank Hastings. 
but uh, Dr. Hastings died prematurely while he was in that position. And when I was uh, asked to uh, head up the program, I am, uh, moved, our, our family moved to Bethesda and the, one of the first persons I went to see was Ben Burton. And uh, he had uh, developed uh, a uh, conference and where they had all of their contractors come every year with a public presentation and proceedings. And I went to Ben and said, listen, boy, we need something like that. Uh, can uh, we uh, emulate what you've done? And he said, sure. And it couldn't have been more helpful. Not long after that, um, the NIDDK stopped the kidney program. And um, I was new at NIH, but I thought I'd give it a whirl. So I went to see the director of the Institute and I uh, pointed out that they had developed this capacity and uh, all of these people were gonna be off uh, paying their mortgages, working at different things. They're not going to uh, keep working in an artificial kidney program that's not uh, have some underpinning. And um, he uh, disagreed with me nicely and said he thought that industry would take this over and do the risky research, but it's really uh, public uh, funding that uh, handles the risky research, the new innovations, and then they're de-risked and then picked up by industry. And so they, they stopped the program. If I can follow up on that, John, um, this is fascinating that the Kidney Institute of the NIH and the Heart Institute had programs, but obviously you were able to continue the, yours. And today we have something on the market and theirs uh, did, not, did not continue beyond the early work and dialysis. I was curious, like how you were able through, through these mechanisms, how did you bring the companies to join you? And at what point did you get them engaged or at the point did they feel it was sufficiently uh, acceptable for them to engage? Well, uh, it's an interesting question because uh, we were also working in the phase of the SBIR program, Small Business Innovation Research. And um, uh, some of these uh, groups uh, developed their own kind company using SBIR funds. So they competed for uh, SBIR funds on um, the work that they were doing uh, initially under contract. And um, they were able to get uh, funding to actually uh, set up the company. Like for instance, the HeartMate 2 uh, was basically uh, done through Nimbus, uh, a, a small SBIR funded company. And uh, Ken Butler was the uh, project manager. He was my uh, uh, role model for how you manage a, uh, a, uh, a project in that all of these teams uh, work together. They uh, the artificial kidney or the artificial heart, there's just too many, uh, too many requirements that are not known yet, that uh, we weren't gonna get them from one group, but that it took this collaborative effort to begin to uh, move forward and go through these various generations of devices. And um, we did have clinical adverse events. And we learned from those and we modified the um, uh, technology to uh, work on reducing those adverse events. And we still have them, but we have a, the rate has dropped off uh, uh, quite uh, dramatically. And how long did it take from when the, when the program started to when the first trials started? Um, well, the first 
the program started in about 1966, I think. And um, it, 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 it's an interesting question because <laughs> the NIH uh, funded six programs. I, well, yeah, they funded six programs to look independently at how you might create an artificial heart. Hmm. Basically, they all wanted to mimic nature. Uh, although they did come up with um, those two basic requirements of 10 liter per minute cardiac output and a normal blood pressure. You wouldn't want an abnormal blood pressure. But, um, so that wasn't so novel, but they uh, highlighted that. And then they did, an additional uh, study to look at the six studies and come up with a single study. Uh, well, all of that was uh, very thoughtful and uh, all the people that were very uh, um, dedicated to the issue, um, they really didn't deal with the real needs <laughs> of uh, uh, Nature surprises you. And I'm sure Shuvo has seen this in spades that uh, we could not mimic uh, the natural system, but we had to come up with a way that it's an engineered system. Uh, we know the inputs, we know what we want to get as an output. We have some variables we can control, and we have many unknown variables. And so, um, uh, so 1966, they started with those studies. So it was probably 1970, roughly. And then it was uh, 1990, uh, uh, early 1990s when the rematch study started. Wow. So a lot of work in between then and 20, uh, yeah. 26 years or so, 24 or something like that. And you guys pioneered and trailblazed um, in a way that was, you know, first of its kind. I was well, we, and you're a little more on your question. We also started uh, uh, two or three other companies through similar mechanisms. Um, they didn't take NIH funding. Uh, there were grant, or what should I say, contract research funding, but it came through the SBIR program or through their own initiative. Uh, Thermo Cardio Systems started with a group that was working with Thermo, which was a big uh, thermodynamics company. And uh, they uh, got spun off um, uh, essentially, uh, the group bought out that part of the thermo and uh, were able to start the company. And they did one thing that was I never heard of. They sold stock that um, they said that uh, if the people eventually wanted to would sell their stock, they would buy it back at the same price that they paid for it. So never heard of anybody doing that, but people bought into that company and that company was eventually acquired by another company and uh, all of the shareholders uh, received their uh, funds through their own, that sale, that acquisition. It's one of the things that you mentioned, John, you mentioned SBIRs, and for the audience, that's a, a special program in the US for uh, governments to support commercialization. Uh, you mentioned this uh, stock market approach. Did you find individual investors willing to put in money on any of these programs early on at that time? No, uh, we did not. Uh, we did not seek them. Um, but it's... Again, I think it's really too early for uh, philanthropy at that stage. The risk uh, is uh, a little high for companies or for individual philanthropists. Uh, they need 
a dedicated um, leadership nationally, um, a, a go-to place. Um, they needed uh, uh, an opportunity to work together. We, based on Ben Burton, we developed a annual conference. Uh, the conference um, grew to where we had uh, up to 400 people coming to uh, uh, hear the contractors and also our grantees that were working on materials and other things that associated, not all with the artificial heart program, but in terms of cardiovascular uh, disease diagnosis and treatment. One of the things you mentioned um, was people, you know, with the percutaneous and the challenges of percutaneous not going to swim. Can you talk a little more about what those challenges were and how eventually sort of the field has moved to address them by becoming better transcutaneous or completely going out from transcutaneous approaches? Well, uh, first, um, well, uh, a natural mechanism is when something like a percutaneous lead is uh, put in through the skin, the uh, epidermis um, tends to grow in around whatever's piercing it to tunnel down around it and extrude it. And so, um, there's been, I'd call it a uh, sort of a, a quasi mutual agreement between the lead <laughs> and the patient uh, to uh, minimize the, uh, the uh, threat of that extrusion occurring. It's not uh, totally satisfactory, but uh, as I said, uh, patients have lived as, 18 years with a percutaneous lead um, and been able to, to manage it. Now, as far as transcutaneous goes, we also did that and we showed you could, uh, in a pig uh, model, that you could have transcutaneous power transmission um, for two years. But there's an, another set of problems. You get skin erosion, by uh, you have to, it's continuous power. You have to, for two watts at the level of the blood, you need somewhere between uh, probably 10 to 12 watts uh, being transmitted across the intact skin. Um, internal batteries, uh, you may get um, 30, 45 minutes. Uh, then you have to. Uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, recycles you can do under an implanted uh, power a battery system is maybe 2,000. Well, if you want to go 10 years, you need uh, uh, way beyond 2,000 uh, recycles as the internal battery. So you got to replace the battery. Uh, you got these uh, erosion occurred be between the transcutaneous uh, uh, coils on either side of the skin and uh, it's inductive uh, coupling. And if they're misaligned, uh, it's going to be a hot spot for the patient. So there's, uh, it's not an easy area to deal with. So in, in your, uh, the systems that, uh, that uh, ultimately will be necessary for uh, implantable kidneys will also need, I'm sure we'll need some power somewhere along the line. And uh, there'd be a similar issue for the uh, implanted kidney. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so the way we've worked on that is for the actual blood flow, uh, the hope is to have a low resistance system. So you actually don't need a mechanical pump and see if you can get away with just cardiovascular perfusion pressure. But that, if we do need a supplemental power for any monitoring or electronics, 
uh, would hope there'd be some uh, power technology and based on, I guess, what we know from the times now, the battery technologies have been are getting better, but I imagine that's still a limitation in when you were working on it, the battery defined, was it that, that defined the lifetime of the two years or was it something that else that brought the lifetime of two years? Um, the lifetime of two years uh, uh, evolved from a, a number of angles. Uh, one, my, one of the personal ones for me, I'm sure all of my colleagues and the workers in the field all had uh, their own personal uh, feeling about that, was if I went to a patient and said, uh, we'd like to do major surgery on you, and I can tell you reliably that uh, this pump will operate for two years, that uh, a patient is gonna feel a lot better than that if, and then if I come and say, uh, something like, we don't know how long it'll last, <laughs> or it's the last six months or a year. Um, so that's what prompted the two-year goal, was uh, patient, what uh, you could reliably uh, provide to the patient. In the reliability studies, we had 12 systems on test. Four, 12, uh, four different devices, uh, 12 at each site. In fact, one of them was in uh, your area um, in Oakland. And um, the, um, uh, the rooms where they were housed, they were on a mock loop. The uh, systems were quarantined so that no one had access to them is just like they'd be in the patient. Uh, they're inaccessible. And uh, could they operate for two years without interruption? And uh, basically you're allowed one failed device. 11 out of 12 needed to pass the two year mark to uh, meet the Weibel reliability standards. So um, out of the four systems, one did. The other three failed. Um, kind of uh, along those same lines, there's a uh, audience question about um, the issue of the re reliability of um, artificial heart devices. And people have heard that there's still um, reliability problems, but does that mean that the technology um, it, itself isn't reliable? Uh, the technologies themselves have been shown to be quite reliable. And I, uh, I, I'm, uh, um, I think the uh, questioner is a very good question. Um, the, uh, the adverse events, and I think they're talking about, to some extent, the reliability in terms of adverse events as well as technical reliability. The technical reliability, uh, mm -hmm. the FDA uh, has, uh, uh, by the way, when we did these uh, original studies and we did site visits, we took the FDA with us um, to be uh, involved in, uh, in helping guide uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that these would meet FDA mission requirements, that they would be uh, reliable, where the, uh, adver uh, the adverse events were much higher to start with and um, have uh, the rate has gone down with each success successive uh, uh, generation of uh, the uh, SIS devices. Um, no, that's a, a very reasonable question. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's good to hear. Um, and then there's another question about um, why isn't there, why do you think there isn't a tissue engineered heart available despite so much research in the regenerative medicine and stem cell space? Um, you know, uh, Doris Taylor was the first to really 
show uh, that you could decellularize parts and resell and re uh, use that extracellular matrix that's left to uh, repopulate it with cells. Uh, the difficulty has always been that the actual power that the uh, tissue engineered part um, has been so weak that it couldn't sustain uh, the uh, patient circulation. So I, in terms of watts, for example, uh, it might put out a quarter of a watt or half a watt, but it couldn't get anywhere near two watts of, of power output. And um, uh, I, I think again, uh, that I think the artificial, an implantable artificial kidney will uh, have similar uh, requirements eventually in terms of meeting the objectives that are um, hoped for for these patients mm -hmm. in providing a, a quality of life and function that they deserve. Hey John, so you're probably aware of the work that's been recently reported on xenotransplant. Was that a consideration when you guys are starting your program and was that a discussion point about xeno versus mechanical uh, approaches? Yes, it, it's every decade that's been discussed. And um, the uh, uh, Dr. Shumway at Stanford always had this interesting perspective. He would say that the xeno transplants are very promising and they always will be. <laughs> so uh, uh, Bartley Griffiths is a very good friend. And uh, as you know, he did a, uh, uh, a pig uh, cardiac transplant. The patient uh, uh, did well for a few days and then started trending downward. Um, will there be someday a tissue engineer? I have no idea, but I, uh, it won't be in my lifetime. Maybe uh, our my grandchildren will uh, see something like that. But I, it's hard for me to envision making valves, making uh, cardiac uh, muscle, uh, making trabeculi to hold the valves in place, uh, to making. Um, uh, if you're going to mimic nature, now if you're going to make a tube more like we're doing now and uh, uh, create a, if you will, say a heart made three with the cells, uh, something like that could actually probably be doable. We actually did um, a, uh, a program where we looked at, you can turn uh, skeletal muscle into fatigue resistant cardiac muscle. And we did that with a, a biologically powered uh, artificial heart, which is, was essentially a tube and um, showed that that was possible. But again, it was very difficult to get the power necessary uh, to uh, pump enough blood to provide a patient with a good quality of life. So we didn't pursue that further, but that has been done and is well documented. Uh, Larry Stevenson did that work. Great. Well, we're almost at the hour, but since we had that little glitch, um, I think we can go over a few minutes. So but we can get a few more questions in. Okay, sorry um, about that. Oh, no, it's it's fine. Um, Shivo, uh, there, there also is a lot of curiosity about the um, artificial kidney. So um, we should maybe get a couple of those questions in. Um, the, the first one is, um, can you update us on the status of um, the preclinical animal experiments? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you, audience. Thank you for uh, paying attention. We, I really thought and that uh, the... 
lessons from the artificial heart um, would be interesting for you guys to hear, partly because it gives you sense for how much work went into it. It's almost 40 years of worth of work and I'd like to think we're standing on the shoulders of giants, giants like Dr. Watson and some of his colleagues, so that we can learn valuable lessons and maybe uh, you know, make the timeline a little shorter. But as you can see, it does take effort. Um, let me just speak specifically to where we are with the preclinical studies. What we've done uh, after a decade of really focusing on this is build small scale devices, that have kidney cells and the silicon semiconductor filter, put them together and they show that they work. And some of you have heard me talk about this. We've shown videos about that milestone starting late last year, beginning of this year. So the next step for us is to take it way before we can get to even human studies is to show a number of different uh, components of technology reliability, but also therapeutic capacity. So working with our team, we have gone through, we have created a matrix of all the different types of uh, work we need to show. And then we've been also fortunate to have engaged with the FDA through their breakthrough device program to get a roadmap of how this might eventually get into human studies and ultimately to a, uh, a commercial approval. Again, very high level, but initial discussions. Those are very helpful. So one of the things we learned from them was we, you need to be able to establish safety of the device. I think we all know FDA is about safety and effectiveness, but safety is paramount. So we had discussions with them about how do you demonstrate safety and how do you do it in a way that is economically feasible given the challenges of uh, funding that are out there. Through the discussions, they identified that the first element is to show the device can operate without losing uh, its blood filtering capacity because a catastrophic failure could be the formation of blood clots. So once we identified that and working with them and our team, we said, let's focus on that as the critical element. And we've decided that we'll first work on scaling up the filter unit to a therapeutic capacity, and then show that it can provide the therapeutic uh, value to the, in a preclinical stage, in this case, an animal like a uh, pig, for example. And once we've shown some level of evidence that it functions, and the discussions with the FDA as an initial milestone, show that it functions for 30 days, then come back to us. And we'll talk about moving on to a subsequent step. Not because it's complete, but because that's a key milestone of safety. So we have over this past year, using uh, the grant funds and some of the uh, philanthropy uh, and some of the prize funds, worked on scaling up the filter. And starting this week at the American Society of Nephrology, we'll begin present some results and at one of my future YouTube will provide a summary of that work to the audience. But we are scaling up the filter from a small scale to a clinical scale. That may sound just two different words, clinical and uh, small, but the work that has to go into it is significant. And then we also have not, we also have to make sure that it's reliable. And that also brings means that we have to find partners and we're trying to do this with partners that are familiar with scaling, with manufacturing, with making sure things can get put together without leaks or breaks, et cetera. So that's where we are right now, Liz. Thank you. And if, if about... I could just c comment, uh, I guess I um, disagree a little with the FDA and that is um, 30 days is too short. Uh, our finding was that you could get away with an awful lot in 30 days um, in the human or the animal. Uh, but after uh, 30 days, the next month was a real test. So um, going for a few months is 
uh, in my view, uh, um, a more, a better indicator of safety than 30 days, but I'm not the FDA. So. <laughs> and and no, to be fair, John, I don't think they say 30 is sufficient. 30 is the first, if you can get to 30 days, you know, we gotta do it. So I think it's, we have to be clear that they didn't say 30 days is it. It's more like, come back to us once you have 30 days, we'll talk about the next steps. I just wanna be Good. fair and clear that they didn't say 30 days and then you're safe. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's, that, that's a good point. You talk about, uh, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit okay. about how long you tested in your preclinical models uh, when you guys did these long-term studies? Um, the animal tests were certainly not two years. Um, they were, uh, I think, six months at the time. And um, you had to, uh, you they had to be uh, technically repeatable in terms of implanting. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do 25 animals, have 20 die and work and report five. <laughs> you had to get seven or eight in a row to show that it was reliable clinically, uh, surgically, as well as uh, met uh, certain goals. Uh, in terms of adverse events and thrombus formation, things like that. So we had a, a rigor in the animal studies as well as in the uh, mock loop studies. Did you, um, as, a, as a program uh, director, did you tell, tell them that here are the types of preclinical models you have to use? And here's the length of time, or did you let them sort of come up and give you their best uh, points on that? Uh, they were, uh, um, if you will, uh, uh, set by uh, both NIH and FDA in terms of goals that were acceptable, like you said, uh, in terms of the initial safety trials. Um, Certainly, the uh, uh, F we wanted the FDA to, to have uh, input into those types of requirements, so we met them to start with and not have to repeat a, a set of studies. Did you uh, you talk about you know um, the idea for the two years, and you mentioned you know patients was there actually a formal effort to engage with patients or did that happen more informally? It was more informal. I think uh, the, uh, the, kidney, uh, the kidney field is doing a much better job of uh, connecting with patients. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, uh, that would have benefited our program as well, I'm sure. Um, uh, Dr. Watson, another question for you is, um, given all the, all the lessons that you learned over the course of the artificial heart um, story, how hopeful are you that um, the artificial kidney program will eventually get to um, the point that artificial heart devices are now? Um, and, and what would need to happen for that to become a reality? Uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that um, there's a roadmap that's been developed. Uh, our goal was to have the original pathway uh, and that if we had a, a pathway to clinical use, that that would be then uh, duplicated in next generation devices by funds outside of the NIH. And I, I think that that's feasible uh, for the uh, artificial kidney field. Um, <clears throat> eventually, <laughs> I'm, uh, as uh, I've, uh, I've been a little concerned that there isn't that underpinning for the, the program uh, that would help it move forward more um, expeditiously. Mm -hmm. um. All right, and 
Shibo, before we end, maybe we'll do one more question um, on the artificial kidney side. Um, I think we should clarify if um, any human trials of any um, artificial kidney technologies have started yet, because um, that's a popular question in the chat. And if not, if they haven't yet, when will they start? Well, as a, well, as a question that people want to know, and that's fine. So um, I think we have to do these preclinical studies with the filter, show that it's, fi it's functional, and then, as I said, we'll go back to the FDA and they'll tell us you know, if it's sufficient or not. But the very first study that will involve humans, that will touch humans, is an external version of the device to show the materials do not react adversely to the patient or the patient doesn't adverse, react adversely to the materials. It's a short-term in-hospital study. And... That study would be the first one for that. We'll have to build a clinical skill device. It's not an implanted device. Then we'll go and we'll follow the guidelines that the FDA has on the hemodialyzer uh, performance and safety guidelines. And if, the, the, if uh, we meet those uh, preclinical uh, metrics in terms of toxicity, and uh, performance, then we'll go back to the FDA for an IDE enabled external study of our filter. Now that's going to be within you know, a day or less. So that would be the first one. If everything goes well, that's a, again, if everything goes well means this technology moves, no pandemic and we have the resources. <laughs> you can see that work happening within the context of 18 to 24 months, but there's those ifs. Uh, but and it is engineering, and then I think to the point that one thing that Dr. Watson makes a point of very rightly so, is that you want to make sure the technology reliability is established for this less than one day study, which is different from the implant study. Uh, the challenges may be less, but nonetheless we have to go through the exercise of collecting that data, and hopefully between uh, the technology progress and the support that there may be at a programmatic level, we hope that will come. Uh, that may allow us to then get that within the context of a couple of years if everything goes well. Again, I'll put a caveat, things can happen. We had a pandemic that really threw <laughs> us off. Uh, and many of you who have followed our work thought we'd be ready to submit an IDE for the external some time back and that got delayed and the pandemic has really pushed us back. So I just want people to be aware that some of the issues are beyond our immediate control. Definitely. All right, and then I think we'll give the last question to Dr. Watson. Um, for patients that are interested in trying to help support the, the development of the artificial kidney field, do you have any advice on things that they can do? Oh, hmm. In other words, let me paraphrase. They they are interested in what could they do to help uh, support the the next generation uh, artificial exactly kidneys. Well, uh, one I I think the advocacy groups that they have uh, can uh, talk with their congressional representatives. You know, the mandate initially came from Congress that there should be an artificial kidney. So um, I don't know if there's ever been uh, hearings. So with my director, we uh, attended hearings that were put on through that, at that time, the House of Representatives on what had we done to meet the objectives of the artificial heart program. So uh, it would be interesting to have a hearing uh, to uh, get an update so that Congress is aware of what's happened in the field mm -hmm. since their original request that there be an artificial kidney. That's a great idea. I think that would be a great goal to push for. Um, so I think it, we'll it leave it something at something that's feasible and doable. Yeah, uh, definitely. 
So I, I think we'll leave it here for now. Um, Dr. Watson, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. Um, we will be back again next month and um, we look forward to reconnecting then and happy Halloween, everyone. Thanks.